to our big future vision of really connecting people across all verticals of love and friendship and business and going international and taking our mission to different corners of, of the earth and really helping put the power into women's hands when they connect. And we're so excited and humbled to be in this, in this uh, seat right now. And Whitney, as you look at your business model, um, you know, big number of users and growing fast, but just a small percentage of them are paying subscribers. How important is it to Bumble and Badoo, your other apps of future, to get more people to pay on a monthly basis? Yes, this is high priority. We are very committed to, you know, reinvesting in future monetization features and product offerings to convert a higher penetration of our customers to becoming paying users. We'll do this through a bevy of subscription services, higher tier, and other um, adjacent opportunities. Good morning, it's John Fort. Uh, I want to mention the indications now are uh, seventy-five. Uh, dollars a share. We'll, we'll see where this opens. I want to ask about Badu because I, I believe you said that it was in the latest quarter that you reported 39% of revenue uh, is from this app that isn't as women-led, but of course that, that core uh, Bumble app is growing much faster. What is the future of Badu? Do you expect it to decline? Are you transitioning people over into more of a Bumble experience? What should investors expect to see from that legacy app? Yeah, no, it's, listen, it's a great technology platform and there's a very loyal customer base in a lot of international markets for Badoo. And what we're really focused on is really reinfusing our mission of an accountable, kind digital ecosystem and leveraging their incredible legacy technology, which has been an innovator and pioneer in this digital space. They were one of the first to market with video dating a year prior to the pandemic. And so really taking that technology and putting a new emphasis on the brand and, and really making sure that we merge under this one you know, umbrella brand of Bumble Inc., which really encourages a kindness, accountability, and uh, you know, making the first move more broadly. But for Bumble, we'll stay committed to women making the first move. And, and tell us about that both brand and cultural journey that um, Bumble has been through. Because a year and a half ago, very different story uh, when, when uh, Andre Andreev, you know, w was still in the picture here. And there are all these questions about the culture that he had built around that company that in effect owned Bumble at the time. Um, you said that you hadn't experienced the kind of misogyny that some people were alleging that he brought to his corporate culture, but how have you built beyond that and what did you learn from that experience? Yeah, so today Bumble is all about looking forward and we are committed to our customers, but we're also very committed to our team. We have merged under one consolidated uh, internal team and we are all here for diversity, inclusion, equality, and breaking down barriers that have, you know, historically existed in the tech landscape. And we're very grateful to, you know, the, the technology and the team that came before us. But we are looking forward and we're really excited about building an inclusive, uh, not only user base and technology platform, but a, a, a culture where all of our team members can thrive. Whitney, speaking of the user base and thinking of engagement, I wonder, can you talk about how you view the way in which the pandemic altered engagement behavior and whether or not you see that changing again once we get out from under this thing? Absolutely. So the pandemic has been, you know, incredibly uh, difficult time for people around the world. But what I think it highlighted was the need for relationships. Now more than ever before, we recognize the importance of having companionship and community. And what we've also seen is that people are really leaning into a digital first approach when it comes to building their relationships. So prior to the pandemic, you would see people engage on the product and then they would jump into the real world as far as interaction went. And this fascinating shift has taken place that we think is here for the long term, which is people are getting to know each other on our products. They are spending time on video, on audio. They're socializing, building relationships, building connections, and understanding if they're compatible digital first. Some folks are actually building the foundation of their relationships. We're talking several months of getting to know each other digitally before they end up meeting in real life. And then the, the meaningful relationships that come out of this are profound. This also engineers an extra layer of safety and accountability into your relationship journey. If you can get to know someone by video and understand if this is someone you feel safe with, this is someone you actually want to meet. 
meet, it really takes out a lot of the cumbersome nature of just going offline immediately. All right, so as we, and I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more of this as the country gets vaccinated, but this notion that we're hungry for human uh, to human contact, that we're going to want to go back to, I guess, classic environments like restaurants and bars and blind dates, you think is not dispositive of further growth on the digital front? Completely, uh, completely positive for us. As the world slowly transi transitions back to normal, we think we have this massive opportunity to help people uh, meet each other in a seamless way, in a way that maybe feels safer than the, the historical opportunity is going to a bar or a concert or to a crowded place. And even as the world completely goes back to normal, the ease and the, the, the opportunity that online dating offers will be here to stay. We really think that this is a seismic shift for the better, and we think that this is a long-term industry with long-term staying power and, and long-term uh, meaning both during and post-pandemic. And Whitney, I want to get a better sense of where you see Bumble fitting into the competitive landscape for online dating. Um, you know, you're up against Match, Facebook also making a move in the online dating space. And any platform could copy Bumble's female first led approach. Yeah, no, I totally ap appreciate that that opinion. And, and, you know, we've seen that happen over the years. But Bumble is not a feature. Um, Bumble is not a gimmick and Bumble is not just a technology uh, redesign. Bumble is a brand and we are authentic and we have engineered this brand from the ground up and, and that is something that cannot be replicated. Features and products, absolutely, people can build those and we, we love the innovation coming out of the space, but you cannot replicate a brand and that's something we're really proud of and we continuously reinvest in our brand and in the, in the mission ahead of us to really put women in the driver's seat of their relationships and more broadly with the do and, and the broader ecosystem of, of connecting to really engineer safety and accountability into the experience to make it pleasant for everyone. And your your rival Match has bought another app that's focused more on friendships. And I'm wondering going forward how important your non-dating business is. You have Bumble BFF for friends and Bumble Biz for business networking. How much are those and perhaps other non-dating businesses going to be for your growth? They'll be very important in the long term. In the near term, we're very focused on dating. We think there's tremendous opportunity ahead of us to rewrite the norms of dating around the world. And love needs a, a facelift in terms of how we treat each other and, and how we do so accountably with, with health and equity at the, the base of that. And so for the meantime, we are very focused on taking our dating approach across the globe and doubling down on our uh, strength and our growth in our domestic and core markets. But in tandem, in parallel, we're looking to the future, and we're very focused on a long-term horizon of being the global platform to connect you to anyone you might be looking for well beyond love. And so stay tuned. Wow, Whitney, that, that's going to run you right up against Facebook, but also into a really big market opportunity. I'm so glad that you put Biz and BFF into that context because, you know, in some of these S1s, you know, companies try to present themselves as something other than their core. I think back to GoPro when they were talking about themselves as a media company. Glad to hear that you're not doing that. But tell us, I mean, you said that Biz and BFF are longer term. What can you tell us about the important metrics and data associated associated with those. Maybe we're not ready to talk revenue yet, but what kinds of engagement are you looking to build in that will show you the health of those ideas over time? Absolutely. Well, I think it's important to emphasize that we evolved our product offering to include friendship and business because that is what our community was commanding. We were watching the behavior take place in our product and we were listening to our customer, which if you do that thoughtfully, they are your best roadmap. And we recognized that because we had this strong barrier to entry of women making the first move, women in particular, but men as well, were commanding their profile to look for platonic relationships. And when we saw this take off, we built a feature around it. And the fact is, we have 9% of our dating customers using the friendship mode right now in a very V1 version. It's important to note that we have not optimized or invested or really um, put time or effort into the friendship category yet. So it's in a very, call it test phase still. So to see that type of adoption just shows you the massive opportunity ahead. Can you give the viewers, Whitney, a, a sense of um, R&D, uh, where, where that budget goes, and to what degree 
uh, artificial intelligence, computer learning plays in, in figuring out the, the right algorithms or, or figuring out what we want, perhaps, before we actually are able to tell you? Sure. So I, I can't talk too granularly about our algorithms and the approach to that, but I can tell you that we invest uh, a lot into both very strategic uh, team members and, and capital more broadly into data, understanding the customer, understanding how and who they want to meet. And we really factor that into our algorithms very thoughtfully and meticulously. And we will continuously reinvest in that as time goes on. We understand the importance of seeing who you want to see, not just seeing people. And so we're really focused on this quality approach. We think our quality growth and our quality audience is ultimately what has propelled our growth thus far. The fact that we are predominantly an organic growth business is something that we're very proud of and we protect.